Hi, my name is Chris Parkhurst. I'm a documentary filmmaker, and I'm also the host of the Documentary Life podcast, a show that spans 140 episodes, has been downloaded in over 135 countries, and uh, I've been producing for about five years. I decided to put each and every episode up here onto YouTube to sort of expand the audience, and as we say in the show, maybe inspire and inform some more doc filmmakers, hopefully like yourself. Um, in the episodes, you may find some older, maybe outdated URLs, in particular, any of the documentary filmmaking courses that we do offer online. If you have any questions about the URLs, simply look in the show notes on this page here on this YouTube page, and that'll be able to take you where you need to go to. Other than that, I hope you enjoy the show, and uh, it's great to have another listener to The Documentary Life. Have a great day. Microphone check, one, two, three. City, city, sibilance, sibilance. Levels check, good, sounds good. One, two, three, rolling and... Documentary filmmaking is often an isolated experience. It's so all-consuming, you know, it's like you're in a cave for a year or two years or however long it takes you to make your film. And even if you're a veteran filmmaker, you know, you still go into your cave and then you come out of that cave and there's always changes that are going on in the, the documentary marketplace. Film festivals are the place where you can kind of plug into your industry and catch up on what's new. Hello and welcome to The Documentary Life. This is a show that sets out to inspire and inform you on how to best live and lead your own documentary life. I am your host, Chris G. Parkhurst, and this is episode 103, and it is brought to you by Musicvine, the coolest music licensing platform with the freshest sounds for your documentary projects. Last week, I detailed how I began prepping for my journey to Cambodia, which actually began as prepping for an annual big three-week corporate video gig that took me to six different cities in a short amount of time. I was going to need to pack travel and film gear for both trips, a tricky endeavor since we were dealing with two entirely different climates and two entirely different types of shoots. If you haven't listened to that episode, I'd highly recommend going back and listening to episode 102 or episode 101 if you need to start at the beginning. You might also consider reading the accompanying blog which I wrote which detailed my essential travel doc filmmaking gear list. All of this of course can be found at our website thedocumentarylife.com. This is part three of our nine-part series called Chris in Cambodia. Love FM, nice when five, bit five, don't wanna let you go. I've been in Cambodia's capital city of Phnom Penh for a couple of hours now. I've been coming to the city since around 2003 when I first started doing documentary work in the country. That was on the film Bomb Hunters, a film that I've referenced a number of times on the show. It was seminal for me because it really introduced me to both documentary filmmaking as well as Southeast Asia. Back then, Phnom Penh was a pretty welcoming return to civilization after spending weeks on end filming out in the provinces. There were a few Western-style restaurants and bars back then, as more and more tourists they were starting to come through the capital city. Traffic wasn't too bad, still primarily consisting of bicycles, motorbikes, or motos as they call them there, and Southeast Asia's famous tuk-tuks, which were basically glorified chariots driven by a smaller motorbike instead of a horse. Traffic wasn't too bad then, and you could actually get around town fairly easily and cheaply, whatever your mode of choice. I generally took the cheapest route, which was hopping in the back of a moto and speeding through town. In some ways, the Phnom Penh of 2019 is still the Phnom Penh from 2003. You can still get yourself some rice porridge, noodle soup, or my favorite, bai sai chruk, which is rice and pork for breakfast. And you can get it for like $1.50, at most. You can still get around town inexpensively via the motos or tuk-tuks, although you can now also hail these modes of transportation from your mobile device the same way you would like an Uber. You can still visit all of the same big open-air markets that are all over town and still enjoy the Cambodian pastime of haggling for your goods. 
I can still stay at the same $15 guest house on Street 278 as when I first started coming to Phnom Penh. It's the Golden Bridge guest house for anyone familiar with Street 278, or Rue Biroi Jetsit Pambai. And while there are some things in Phnom Penh that have really not changed all that much over the years, there also is a ton of the city that has, in fact, made way to progression. There's construction and high-rises all over the city. The internet is a lot more reliable, faster, and cheaper. There are a lot more barang, or foreigners, doing business and living in Phnom Penh. Western-style restaurants and bars are now commonplace. Street 278 has actually become pretty intolerable now. The Golden Bridge Guest House, it's still operating at 15 bucks a night, but it now has way more competition. Fancier hotels, spas, nightclubs, restaurants that are catered to tourists have all gone up around the Golden Bridge. Which was how I find myself in an Airbnb. Yes, that's another one of the things Cambodia somehow now has, Airbnbs. I found myself in an Airbnb in the center of town, right across the street from the infamous Pasao Tua Tampong, also known as the Russian Market, as it's more commonly known in Phnom Penh circles. I was living in one amounted to a studio apartment in an old shabby building inhabited by cheap jewel and gem sellers on the first floor, a Phnom Penh style hair salon on the second floor, and about eight apartments on the next two floors, all containing Khmer, that's Cambodian, families. My studio apartment was small and tidy with a few pieces of, shall we say, vintage pieces of furniture. It was also clearly just cement and rebar that had been repainted in the past year for the purpose of jumping into the new Airbnb Cambo-style craze as quickly as possible. The walls were fairly thin. I heard just about everything from my neighbors, including them working all day and into the night, but we'll get into that in a bit. Right outside my back door, which was entirely made of glass, I had a small balcony which looked out directly onto the market. And it was as loud as any good capital city in Southeast Asia should be. The horn started up around 7 a.m. in the morning, and they didn't really finish up until around midnight. Oh, one more thing. It was hot. Like, really hot. These walls were dark, they were cement, and there was little ventilation since there was only one small window near the makeshift kitchen. But the back doors were these interesting, really big foldable glass doors, as I said, and they opened very wide. When opened, it was good to help get a little breeze going through, but too loud for any serious kind of work to be done. In my case, it was going to be editing. The noise was definitely something I was going to have to contend with in terms of the edit. And I was going to have to figure out something a bit more secure to lock the doors with when I was away. For the most part, I'd never ever run into any kind of problem in Cambodia in like 16 years, but I did have a lot of camera gear, so why tempt fate? And there was also this matter of the large cockroach that had just scurried underneath the sink. Cockroaches were just kind of no-goes for me. But hey, I was back in Cambodia, and at this very moment, I couldn't have asked for anything more. I've been in Cambodia's capital city of Phnom Penh for a week now. It's gotten progressively hotter. The days have somehow started to run together a little bit. The traffic has now become unbearable, to the point where I don't really want to travel much to other parts of town. The constant noise down below in the street is really starting to get to me, especially the metal grinding, the clacking of the ice cutter that just seemed to go on all day and well into the evening. And the horns, horns, horns. Trucks, scooters, tuk-tuks, SUVs, sometimes vehicles that looked something straight out of a Dr. Seuss book. All of them had loud horns and often belched pretty disgusting particles into the air on top of that. In short, Phnom Penh was no longer as fun to me as it once was. And making matters worse, I was hoping to have been well into the editing of my work in progress for the film. That was always my intention when I'd set out for Cambodia this time around to spend the first couple of weeks in the city, meeting back up with the family of our chief subject, Sinsi Samut, networking and maybe forming some strategic partnerships with various organizations, and re-immersing myself back into the footage of the film with the intent of getting heavily into the edit before heading out to start shooting again on the film. 
at the very least, I wanted to have this solid 15 minutes work in progress that I could then take out into the world and start forming said partnerships, corporate sponsorships, and hopefully further opportunities for funding like grants or individual donors, also known as rich Cambodians. And I certainly wasted no time at all in getting out into the Phnom Penh experience and networking and making connections. I'd met up with the Sin family, whose father, Sin Chen Chai, and grandfather, Sin Si Samut, were at the heart of our story. All of this was necessary and great. But what wasn't so great was my inability to get into the edit for any substantial amount of time. Sure, I'd opened the project file up many times and thumbed through some of the footage and interviews. I'd opened up transcripts for interviews and attempted to read some of them. But really, most of it ended up amounting to me staring at my laptop, unable to insert much more than a line or two of dialogue here and there. But nothing was feeling right. No edit was coalescing. And I certainly wasn't getting any more connected to our film. Now, whenever I edit on any type of project, whether it's a new or older project, paid gig or, or a passion project, it always takes me a day or two to get into the swing of things, to get into any kind of flow. I've been editing long enough that I'm well accustomed to the process. A lot of frustration and anxiety for the first whole day, and then by somewhere on the beginning of the second, things start to come a bit easier. By midday of day two, I'm in the flow. But this was not happening at all with Elvis. It had been a week since I'd arrived back to Cambodia, and I'd been attempting some kind of an edit for four or five days now, with no luck or flow happening whatsoever. And now I was getting closer to when I was scheduled to go out into the provinces with good friend and colleague Patrick to begin filming. Only, if I wasn't at least re-familiarized with our footage, I wasn't going to know what we needed when it was time to film again. So I was stressing on this particular morning. I was anxious. I hadn't slept very well. And the transcripts, they just lay open on the bed where I'd fallen asleep. So I got up and did what I'd been doing for the past week. I showered, walked to my current favorite spot for my Baisite Chiruk breakfast, and then I came back to the apartment and opened up the project file. And I sat there, staring at the screen. And I stared some more. And then the sound started. No, I don't mean the horns and humanity of Thuol Tampong, or even the ice cutter. That was all there, of course, but for the most part, that had become background for me. No, this sound was something else entirely, and it was loud and seemingly right outside my door. I turned around to the back door where all of the loud banging was coming from, and that's when I saw the four little Buddhas staring at me. From just below my curtain, on the other side of my glass doors, they sat, facing me, taunting me? Except Buddha statues don't exactly taunt, do they? Well, unless you've gone days without getting barely a minute of anything edited in the edit of your documentary film, then Buddha statues can taunt. At least they did my unrefined, disconnected Western mind. But then I took a deep breath, walked over to the doors, pushed the curtains aside slightly, and I saw something that would change the complexion of my day entirely. I saw my neighbor, a Cambodian probably 10 years younger than I, out on our tiny shared balcony, and he was shirtless with a cloth face mask on. And he was holding one of these little Buddha statues to a fire. And he was turning it slowly around, occasionally pulling it back out, inspecting it, then hammering on the metal, chiseling it into some kind of better form. As I watched him work, I became fascinated by the differing hues of the fire, especially as the flames touched the surface of the Buddha. I saw the beads of sweat making its way down his bronzed back. I observed this man who was undeterred by the sounds of the market below, unfazed by the already sweltering Cambodian sun. He was utterly focused on his one task at hand, the Buddha statues. And I knew what I had to do. I quickly assembled my camera, throwing on the 70-200 glass, grabbed my sticks, and I made my way out into the balcony. He was so immersed in his work, somehow he didn't even notice me six feet from him, setting the camera and beginning to film. 
I honed in on his work, only pausing to adjust my monitor and make some exposure adjustments where it was needed. I made slow pan movements from the fire to the flame touching the Buddha. Even slower, deliberate tilts from the worker's hands to the beads of sweat pouring off his forehead. About five minutes into me rolling, he looked up briefly from his work. He said hello to me and briefly put his hands together. And I put my own hands together. I said to him, Sot Sabai Bong. Hello, friend. How are you? He nodded. I motioned to the camera. Ot Pain Ha? Is this okay? He smiled and nodded again. And then went back to his work. An hour later, I went inside and I offloaded the footage that I'd just shot. I loaded up the project file and I took a cursory look at some of the new clips. They looked great. The lighting was beautiful. The movements were slow, methodical, with purpose. I smiled as I watched this man again do his work, entirely aware somehow, and yet completely removed from all of the chaos of the city, just doing his work lining Buddha after completed Buddha up onto the stoop. My heart was filled with much gratitude for the entire experience, for being witness to this man and his work, to rolling the camera on Cambodia for the first time in four years. I had no true idea how, where, or even if I might end up using any of this footage, but it didn't matter. I was back. I was working on the film again. And so I turned to my edit. And I began making the first of many cuts, which in three days time would result in a solid 15 minute work in progress on our documentary film, Elvis of Cambodia. Thanks for joining me for part three of our series called Chris in Cambodia. For some stills and video to go along with today's story, head on over to the show notes for this episode at thedocumentarylife.com. Next up on TDL, we'll hear from our latest Doc Lifer story, and then after that we'll get right into our conversation with Doc filmmaker, founder and curator of the Doc NYC Film Festival, and host of the wonderful pure nonfiction podcast, Tom Powers. That's all coming up next, here on The Documentary Life. Anyone who's been listening to the podcast for a while knows that I'm a music guy. I love music as an editor, as a filmmaker, a podcaster, as a human. If I'm being totally honest, I'm kind of a music snob. Look, I know what I like and what I don't. And what I tend not to like when I need to license music for my projects is listening to the same old schlock, you know, navigating a complicated archive and paying an increasingly exuberant amount for the service. Does this sound familiar to you too? If so, I've got a great resource to tell you about. While I was in the UK recently, I came across a newer music licensing platform called Music Vine. I found that they had some original fresh takes on music that I was really impressed with, and at prices that any doc filmmaker could actually afford. Plus, they have an easy-to-use interface for searching, and it actually works. The more I looked into Music Vine, the more impressed I became. So much so that the music you're listening to on this season of the podcast, it comes from them. I would recommend you take a look at them for your own doc project. You definitely won't regret it. You can find them by going to their website at musicvine.com. And when you do find some music for your film, be sure to use the promo code MYDOCLIFE, and that's MYDOCLIFE all in caps. That will give you 20% off of your first order. And there's no restriction on the number of tracks or license types. Again, just head on over to musicvine.com and use the promo code MYDOCLIFE when you're checking out. And you'll get a nice little 20% discount on their already attractive prices. In the spirit of connectivity and togetherness of the documentary filmmaking world, which is the essence of why we started the TDL podcast, we are bringing you stories from doc lifers, doc filmmakers like you and I from around the world. If you're interested in contributing your story to doc lifer stories, we'd love to hear from you. Simply write to us at chris at barongfilms.com. Your contribution will help to foster the TDL mission of building a supportive and networked community of doc filmmakers throughout the world. 
About a year and a half ago, Erin McGough set out for Laos to work on her first documentary feature, This Little Land of Mines, a film about the resilience of the Lao people as they live among and work to clear the 80 million unexploded bombs from when the United States secretly bombed Laos more heavily than any country on earth. This is what Erin had to say when we asked her about a big challenge or hurdle that she had to overcome in leading a doc life. She wrote, I don't know how people make documentaries, especially their first, without having someone else support them financially. How can documentary not just be a passion project? Now that I'm well into post-production, I'm able to do a lot of the work on my documentary after I get home from my full-time gig as an editor. But during production, it would have been impossible for me to make this if I wasn't able to move back in with my parents after college. And that kind of sucks, because it means only the people who have the luxury of financial security can successfully make their first or second film. I want to hear stories told by all kinds of different people, not just the ones who can afford to do so. Another hurdle is definitely imposter syndrome. It took me a long time to realize that no one really knows what they're doing. I follow everything online, all the blogs, websites, newsletters, film festivals. I see the big names in the films that are getting a lot of support and attention. It's easy to assume that those filmmakers know exactly what they're doing, and that they're in on some secret that the rest of us aren't. But at the end of the day, we're all just trying to tell stories of things that have impacted us, and there's no qualification for that. I have a feeling that what Aaron has said here resonates with most, if not all of us trying to navigate the financial viability of making our doc films and how that will most likely impact our doc lives, or trying to overcome bouts of imposter syndrome, many times not only dealing with the challenge of making your documentary film, but also convincing yourself that you are, in fact, worthy of being a doc filmmaker. Now, to learn more about Aaron's doc life or story, you can read hers and many others simply by going to thedocumentarylife.com slash blog. And we'd love to hear about your own Doc Lifer story, so please visit our website to learn how you might share yours with us. Or you can always email Steph at stephanie at barongfilms.com, and she will help you submit your story. Tom Powers is the documentary programmer for the Toronto International Film Festival, also known in our circles as TIFF, and artistic director of America's largest documentary festival, Doc NYC. He hosts the podcast's Pure Nonfiction for the TIFF Podcast Network and Documentary of the Week for New York's public radio station, WNYC. He programs for the Pure Nonfiction series at New York's IFC Center. He teaches documentary producing at the School of Visual Arts and previously taught for 12 years at New York University's SCPS. Before working as a festival programmer, Powers spent a decade directing documentaries for HBO and PBS, and he also had a previous career in publishing at Fantagraphics Books. Tom Powers, this has been a long time coming. It's a conversation that I've wanted to have for quite some time. Uh, Welcome to The Documentary Life. Happy to have you with us today. Thank you for having me. Absolutely, Tom. I'd love to know when documentary began for you. Yeah, so I always had a great passion for documentary film that started uh, when I was a high school student in Detroit, uh, going to the Detroit Institute of Arts that had and still has a wonderful film repertory program and seen documentaries there like Hotel Terminus and uh, 17 and 28 Up um, really awakened my interest in documentary. So in uh, in 1994, I came to uh, New York uh, at the behest of another Detroit friend, uh, John Walter, who's a documentary maker, made films like How to Draw a Bunny and Theater of War. And uh, John at that time was um, getting ready to direct his first documentary for PBS's American Experience uh, series after he had Hmm. worked as a 
uh, editor and sound editor for a long time. And, and uh, so he invited me to New York to um, help work on that. And that was really my education. I met uh, the woman who had become my business partner for 10 years, hmm. uh, Mima Spadola. And she and I uh, embarked on our own uh, first film, which was um, called Breasts, interviewing women about their breasts. Right. Had, Mima was the director. I had an all-women crew, uh, except for me as the producer. And, uh, and we were really making that um, just to have something to show for ourselves. Uh, you know, we wanted to make documentaries, and you got to make a first one. So that was our first one. Uh-huh. And uh, we were fortunate that it got uh, bought by HBO at uh, Sheila Evans and uh, who put it on their Cinemax channel in 1997. Wow. And so that was the, the that, that lasted for about 10 years of, uh, of making documentaries. But always, you know, I have to say that that first documentary breasts uh, was got a lot of attention yeah. uh, on HBO. And uh, Meme and I both thought uh, that we were you know that it was it was only going to get easier from there <laughs> right um, you're set right <laughs> and uh you know and i uh, it's always say that like the next 10 years we spent learning you know what an unusual event that success has been <laughs> right it's like working your way back at that point uh, what a way to sort of sort of start out of the gate i mean did you anticipate that with breasts did you anticipate that with the first film that it would be picked up or was it just a hope or you know really i guess no it, it wasn't it wasn't even a hope yeah. i mean it was like our our hope was that we would make a 20 minute film that we could show at festivals yeah and that we would at least have something to show people mm. when they said, have you ever made something before? Yeah, yeah, a um, calling card. And, uh, but it, uh, you know, it was, it was Mima's idea uh, to do it, and she had a great way of interviewing women. And I think that there was, there was, there was something in the air at the time. There was, you know, it was a kind of moment in the zeitgeist mm. when, well, for instance, you know, the very same season that Breasts came out on Cinemax, there was a play in downtown New York, a one woman show called The Vagina Monologues. Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. Uh, by Eve Ensler. So, uh, you know, we were, we, we had touched upon something in the air at the time. Yeah. You know, not long after that, Sex and the City was uh, on HBO yeah. and, um, people were ready to have those kinds of conversations. You know, Tom, it's, it's interesting that you would bring that up because I think that that's always an important thing that we speak to on the show is this idea of, you know, relevance or timeliness with your, with your doc stories. And do you feel like at that time, you know, or sort of say sort of once breasts had been accepted and done very well, did you really realize and have an appreciate appreciation at that time of the timing of that kind of material? And then did you apply it to further work? Were you always aware of like, well, we need to be relevant or we need to have something that's in the zeitgeist? Well, uh, that's a great question. I mean, the word I would most use about that timing is luck. I mean, certainly the, you know, the, the reasons that Beam and I felt like, you know, we could take on that subject matter you know, had to do with other currents, you know, g- going on in the culture. Yeah. Um, but it's not like we, you know, made this calculated decision that, you know, that this was going to, uh, you know, equal some kind of commercial success. We we actually thought the opposite. We thought that we were, you know, making something that was probably going to be limited uh, for commercial outlets yeah. just because they had nudity in it. In the mid-1990s, in, yeah, that, 97. That, that was... That was a little bit uh, more of a prohibiting factor than um, than it would be today in in yeah. uh, with today's digital channels. But the um, the thing I think about from your uh, question is after we made breasts and it uh, had some uh, success, we had ideas for all kinds of other uh, documentaries. I mean, uh, you know, not long after that, I was talking to Christopher Hitchens about making a film about Henry Kissinger. Um, oh boy. And, uh, <laughs> that's been done since then, hasn't it? <laughs> that's right, yes. Um, and uh, and Mima uh, had uh, a different idea for a documentary about uh, children of gay and lesbian parents um, mm. that she made for PBS. But because press had been successful, 
Sheila Evans at HBO came to us and said, okay, now I want you to do one uh, about men yes, um, of course. and their bodies. And our first reaction to that was, uh, no, 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 you know, we, you don't we, understand. This isn't what we do. <laughs> you know, yeah. You know, we just, we just did one of these, like, we don't want to be repeating ourselves. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or, don't pigeonhole or, me, man. <laughs> yeah. Or competing against ourselves. And she was very persistent about it. And, mm. uh, and, and the other ideas we had weren't going anywhere. So, yeah. and, and eventually I think we and I asked ourselves, well, what are we afraid of about, uh, you know, doing a film about, cause there was something specific about doing a film about men that felt different than doing a film about women. Mm. One of the things being that we felt women were just more natural in, in discussing points of vulnerability. And, and we thought it was going to be a tougher assignment to do that with men. Yeah. And then that became, that ultimately became the reason to make the film Totally, is, you know, what are you afraid of? Let, let's go into that. Yeah. And, um, and true enough. And so the second film is called private dicks men exposed uh, with the subtitle. And indeed men weren't as quick to, you know, discuss their vulnerabilities. Instead, they'd kind of put up, you know, a defense mm. of humor or, you know, sometimes self-deprecation or, or other things. But, that, um, you know, th that made for an entertaining film as well. Absolutely. So transitioning from your time as a filmmaker, when and how did the idea of film festivals and being directly involved in them, when did that start to take shape for you? Well, after 10 years of making films, yeah. I was, uh, you know, a little burned out uh, by the experience. And I um, and it, you know, it, it had always been a financially um, tough slog and, and it didn't seem to be getting any better. And I it caused me to reflect on what I liked most about making films and what I liked most about making films were showing them to an audience. Yeah, you know, right. I felt like the two years I would spend making one was all about the, you know, the one night when I would get a theater and show it to my friends and then it would be <laughs> on television and, you know, being on television was a great way to reach an audience, but it was, you know, uh, Richard Leacock once described putting a film on television, like dropping a pebble down a well and never hearing the splash. Wow. Wow. Because you, you know you don't you don't really get an audience reaction like you do when you show something live in the theater. Right. Uh, maybe today you get a little bit more of an audience reaction because of social media, but mm. still the the experience of showing something in theater I think is uh, what most filmmakers live for. So in 2005, I wanted to do more of that yeah. and uh, and create more opportunities for all my filmmaker friends um, who uh, were also looking for that. And it uh, so happened in 2005, the IFC Center um, was opening. The manager of the IFC Center then and now, John Vanko, was someone I'd known from uh, his earlier uh, role when he ran a small distribution company called Cowboy Booking. Hmm. I reached out to John before the IFC Center opened in, uh, in summer 2005 and proposed this idea of, of doing a weekly documentary series. And, you know, for... Um, him, you know, I should say at the same time, I had proposed it to uh, New York's Film Forum, yeah. uh, which was a much more well-established theater. And for them, it, you know, they were so well-established, like it was a hard thing for them to do to, you know, free up one night of the yeah, week. Yeah, right. <laughs> that, that didn't make sense to them. Uh, but for John with a new theater, you know, uh, he, he was more flexible and, uh, you know, ready to, to try new things. So uh, we did that, started in September 2005. The first film we showed was Doug Block's 51 Birch Street. Wow. This is a film about families and how things are never quite what they appear to be. I have a clear memory of that night because I, in my head, I thought, well, you know, if the theater's half full, I'll consider that it's a, a, a success. Yeah. But it, um, it sold out uh, that night. And it was, wow. um, it was proof that... Um, there was an audience, uh, especially in New York City, yeah. that was hungry for that kind of programming. Yeah. And so I ran uh, the series was called Stranger Than Fiction. Uh, then we have just recently changed it to be called Pure Nonfiction yeah. to match the name of our podcast. But, uh, you know, I ran it that fall of uh, 2005. And then at uh, at the end of 2005, the job came open 
at the Toronto Film Festival for documentary programmer. It'd previously been held by Sean Farnell, who uh, was then moving on to go work at Hot Docs. The artistic director of of the Toronto Film Festival at that time uh, was Noah Cowan, who um, who, had, who I'd also known in New York because he had been partners with John Banco in Cowboy Booking. Oh, so wow. that 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 little um, that little distribution company, Cowboy Booking, uh, had uh, a lot of meaning for me because yeah, a the, bit of an impact on your life, eh? Yeah, the 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 two principals, you know, trusted me for the the two biggest changes of, uh, of my career. Wow. So Noah encouraged me to apply for that job, um, at, uh, in Toronto. And I went through the hiring process and started there in 2006. Uh, and from that, Tom, what I'd love to hear is how perhaps your experience as a filmmaker, how that may have shaped an approach to putting together programming for something like TIFF. Yeah, I think it's uh, it's a little bit of a unique situation. When I look around at most of my colleagues in festival programming, there you know some have a hand in filmmaking, but yeah. uh, but not many. Yeah, and you know, I mean, I think the the main thing I can say about that is when a filmmaker arrives at a festival, all the anxieties that they're feeling are anxieties that I've felt myself uh, <laughs> with my own films. Uh, so, you know, you're worried about how the audience is going to take it. You're worried about how the critics are going to take it. You're worried about how the people who are in the film are going to take it. Yeah. You're worried about whether the film is going to get distribution if it doesn't have that already. Uh, you're worried about whether you're going to, you know, make another film. And, uh, you know, those moments are not just about the film that you're showing that day. Mm -hmm. It's also about laying a new chapter in your career and uh, and what the next chapter is. So, uh, you know, as a festival programmer, I try to be mindful of all those things that yeah. um, that a filmmaker is experiencing. And, you know, sometimes one of those stands out more strongly than the others. You know, sometimes like the biggest thing you're worried about is how the people who are in the film are going to react to it. Mm. Sometimes the biggest thing you're worried about is whether it's going to sell to a distributor. Each film is, uh, is different, has a different set of dynamics. Uh, you know, there's also the set of dynamics where, you know, the filmmakers have arrived to the festival and like, there's some big rift between a director and a producer or, <laughs> you know, or someone else on the team. So, uh, you know, having spent 10 years as a filmmaker, yeah. I've, uh, lived through, um, you know, different variations of, of all those things myself, uh, although thankfully I never had a big rift with a, with a collaborator, but I certainly have, you know, friends who have. And so, you know, that's, I, I try to bring that experience to, to being sensitive to what filmmakers are experiencing when they get to a festival. All of that being said, can you give us some kind of insight or perhaps, um, can you help us out with uh, maybe even some tips that we might be able to take as doc filmmakers when we have our films being presented at these festivals? What are a couple of things that can kind of help us get over the hump during these sort of, uh, let's say, anxious moments while our film is being shown or as we're getting ready to show our film to an audience, especially at some, something bigger like a doc NYC or a TIFF. What's a good thing for us to be aware of when we when we come to these festivals as doc filmmakers presenting our films? Some basics are, you know, just like really taking time to understand the dynamics of the festival. Mm. Call a few other filmmakers whose films uh, showed at that festival the last few years. Ask them, you know, what was their experience uh, like? You know, what were the high points? Uh, what did they wish they uh, had done differently? You know, you you need to kind of know what your goals are going into a festival, uh, and it's going to be different if you're. You know, if you're still looking for distribution and yeah. uh, and and that's a goal, um, you know, are you looking for press and, or, uh, you know, or are you trying to hold back press because you want to uh, save uh, press attention for when your film later gets released? Um, you know, there are different ways to uh, manage that. You know, it's great to have a dialogue with the uh, the festival. And, I, you know, I don't mean like, you know, daily emails or phone calls, but right. You know, but at least one established, um, uh, you know, conversation yeah. 
especially to to kind of communicate what your goals are mm. uh, for that screening and to communicate, uh, you know, anything that you any knowledge or uh, groups you have for bringing in an audience that the festival should know about. So, you know, there are, you know, at any festival, there are big theaters and there are small theaters. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, you don't want to be in a big theater if you're only going to get a modest audience and you don't want to be in a small theater, you know, if you know that you've got a network of people that, um, you know, can, can fill it up. And, um, and believe me, a, a festival doesn't want to put you in a big theater if you only can get a small audience. And they definitely don't want to put you in a small theater if, uh, if you know that you get to fill the house. Um, so communicating those things are, are very important. Excellent. Excellent. And Tom, I would say a large percentage of the audience, uh, of our listenership are people who are making their first doc films. We have a lot of first time doc filmmakers that listen to the documentary life Speak to them, because the reality is most of them will not be getting their films initially into a TIFF or a DOC NYC. So why would it be important for why would it be important for someone that's a first time DOC filmmaker perhaps to attend a TIFF or to attend DOC NYC? How will they be best benefiting from this? Well, uh, you know, different festivals have different things going on. Uh, so at, at DOC NYC. In addition to the eight days of public-facing film screenings, there is an eight-day uh, conference called Doc NYC Pro, yeah. uh, where uh, you know, every day we hold uh, panels and um, have happy hours, and and it's a real you know coming together of the documentary industry. You know, we have a, a section at Doc NYC called Only in New York. Uh, where filmmakers can apply with their works in progress. This is not for finished films. It's to um, it's a showcase for works in progress. And and when you're in the only New York showcase, we set up a lot of roundtable meetings with funders, distributors, agents, uh, other kinds of mentors, film festival programmers, etc. So you know, documentary filmmaking is, you know, often an isolated experience. You're in your <laughs> edit room, uh, you're, you know, out in the field somewhere, you're, it, it's so all consuming, you know, it's like you're in a cave for a year or two years or however right. long it takes you to make your film. That's right. And even if you're a veteran filmmaker, you know, you still go into your cave and then you come out of that cave and there's always changes that are going on in the, the documentary marketplace. So, you know, someone who's listening to this podcast now, you know, if they finish their film a year from now, you know, the, there's going to be new changes that are happening. You know, the, 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 the list of leading broadcasters that I ticked off, you know, might have a couple new ones or, you know, or one fewer because someone's decided to get out of it. So film festivals are the place where, you can kind of plug into your industry and catch up on uh, what's new. You know, you've really touched upon something towards the end, the latter part of those comments that we talk that that's often at the heart of our conversation here, or or at least it's certainly at the heart of why I even began the the podcast, the documentary life, to begin with. And that's you know, Tom, I've worked for years in in the commercial industry as well as documentary, and and as you would as you yourself know, working in features or working in commercials, one of the things that you're you're not often lacking in is uh, maybe resources. And what I mean by that is, or networking, that's even, even a bigger point. Because often if you're working commercially or if you're working in the features, as a matter of being able to survive, you make sure that you're networked. So you know who the coordinators in town are. You know who the producers are, the production managers. And you're often intimately connected with people uh, and colleagues within the industry. Conversely, in documentary we often tend to be, as you mentioned, isolated in our work by the nature of documentary filmmaking, by the nature of being independent doc filmmakers. And often we're the ones that need the sort of networking and, uh, and the resources more than anybody else, and yet we're the ones that have it the least. And uh, so I love that you brought that up because we talk about that a lot. And, and as I mentioned, it's really central to why I even began the podcast to begin with. 
Well, there's another layer to that, which is there's a lot of skill sets to documentary filmmaking that are almost like wizard knowledge um, <laughs> in that, you know, they don't it's all you it only gets passed, you know, fr by word of mouth and yeah. by watch by watching someone do it. You can't read it in a book. You can't look it up online. You can't uh, learn it in a class. You have to like, really listen to someone who has, you know, walked down the same road before. And at, at DocNYC Pro, that's what we're trying to do is, yeah. you know, they're not, they're not beginner level uh, conversations. It's, you know, it's meant to be dialogues between mid-career uh, professionals Certainly, it's open for um, uh, beginners, and and anyone can learn a lot. Yeah. But you know, it's it's a it's a level of conversation that's uh, that's meant to be you know sharing this wizard's knowledge. Absolutely, I love it. I love it. And uh, anybody who's listening, we will of course be posting uh, links to uh, topics of conversation that we that we're we're sort of alluding to. Certainly, links to something like Tip or Doc NYC, and in particular, some of the Doc NYC programs that Tom's talking about here. Again, those can be found in the show notes for this episode. Welcome to Pure Nonfiction, the podcast interviewing documentary filmmakers. I'm your host, Tom Powers, the documentary programmer for the Toronto International Film Festival and artistic director for Doc NYC. On today's so, episode, Tom, now I, I, I'm, I'm eager to sort of move on to the latter part of this conversation, and, and, and it's something that I was certainly excited about, and that's moving into... Um, how probably a lot of people know you nowadays, and that's through your own podcast, Pure Nonfiction. I think the more research I did, I think you guys started about two years actually before the, before we did. How did the podcast first come to be for you? A couple things were happening at that time. Well, one was that uh, WNYC, New York's public radio station, uh, reached out to me and my wife, Rafaela Nehausen, who I haven't really spoken of yet, but it should be said, you know, she is the executive director yes. of Doc NYC. She and I, you know, created Doc NYC together with uh, with IFC Center. She has run Stranger Than Fiction and now the Pure Nonfiction uh, series uh, since 2007 with me. So, you know, we're full partners there. And so WNYC asked us in maybe four years ago, uh, to do this weekly spot called Documentary of the Week, uh, where we take you know two minutes to tell you about a film you should uh, see this week, and it was uh, it was an exciting opportunity for me because I hadn't really done radio before and I'd always been interested in it, and it was already in my mind at the time to try a podcast. Oh was, wow, great! You know, there's no uh, there's no secret to why I was thinking about podcasting. It was, you know, in the air it was after serial and, yeah. uh, and companies like Gimlet were, uh, opening up and there just seemed to be a lot of opportunity, um, uh, a lot of growth around podcasting. Um, and I should say, you know, when I think back on the interviews that I've done with filmmakers over the years, um, at TIFF or doc NYC or, on stage at IFC Center or uh, or elsewhere, you know, I I really wish that I had done a better job at capturing them mm. uh, uh, over the years. Because the thing about the big difference between making films and running a film festival is that when you make films, you know, there's something lasting that uh, that comes out of that. You know, the time I put in mm. in the mid '90s making films. I can still share the results of that time, you know, by showing the film. With a film festival, it's a little bit more ephemeral. You put in a lot of time, and the day the festival is over, it's memories, and uh, and it's you know things happen in that space, but it's it's hard to have something to show for it. Mm. So in making a podcast, I felt like. I was, you know, kind of combining these two threads of my uh, career, the, you know, the yeah. experience of making something uh, as a filmmaker and the experience of, 
you know, showcasing other filmmakers works that I do at the film festival. And do you feel like you're kind of getting your, your, your sort of doc filmmaking fix by doing some of these interviews? Do you see some similarities there in the interview process? Definitely. But it's so much easier because it's only audio. <laughs> Tell us about that. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yes, you know, I don't have to worry about, uh, how, uh, the, the room looks or how the lighting is yeah. or, um, or any of that. Uh, I don't have to, you know, carry around as much equipment. The, you know, the, the microphone and zoom recorder I have can fit where my uh, back company pack. that would have been a disruptor in healthcare or do the people you've talked to think that this was a total fantasy. It wasn't a total fantasy because some of the technology is out there to be realized in this area. And by the way, as we briefly pointed out in the film, you know, I think that this was uh, a, an area that needed disrupting. One you know, thing I'm curious about, control. Tom, is in, in, in these episodes, sometimes I'm finding that there seems to be throwbacks to sound bites from the past. How much of this, how much of pure nonfiction is, is taken from prior interviews from, say, some of the film festivals or other events that you've put on versus actual, you know, sit down interviews like you and I are having at the moment? Yeah, uh, I would say that uh, I'm increasingly using opportunities I have when I'm doing live interviews at the IFC center yeah. to repurpose them, um, on the podcast. Yeah. So, you know, uh, in this year, 2019, um, we've so far put out 11 episodes and seven of those have been recorded at live events. Yeah. Uh, okay. The other four were deliberate recordings just for the podcast. You and I have had some mutual guests on our shows like Steve James, Tim Wardle, Mac and Chapman Way, the Wild Wild Country guys. But you, you, Tom, have had the really, really big names in Doc, like the Joe Berlingers, the Alex Gibneys, the aforementioned, I think you said, Agnes Varda. Have you ever had anyone on the show that you've actually been nervous to talk to? You know, I mean, I'd say I'm a little nervous before every show. Yeah. And, you know, if, I mean, if you're... If you're not a little nervous, you know, you're taking it too much for granted. You're, yeah, you know, you're not right. trying hard enough, I think. So first episode of this year, uh, episode 93, I was interviewing Astra Taylor, uh, whose new film is called What is Democracy? Mm. And now, Astra's made three films. Uh, she doesn't have the expansive career of, uh, you know, of an Agnes Varda or, uh, or Werner Herzog. Yeah. But, you know, in that in that the case of her film, she's talking about, you know, a, a hundreds of years of history of democracy going back to Plato. Yeah. And um, and so there's a case where, you know, going into the interview, you know, I, I, I want to be on my game. I, yeah. you know, I want to I want to be asking questions that are, you know, equal to to the hard work that she's put uh, into that film. That's so right. uh, so it doesn't have to be a, you know. Uh, a, a person with a long career to uh, to feel nervous. Tom, as we wrap this conversation up here, I'd, I'd love to ask you, how can podcasters like you or I, how can we best continue to serve the doc filmmaking community? Yeah, you know, uh, that's a big question. Mm. And um, I'm not sure I have a great answer for it, or I don't have any answer that doesn't sound presumptuous in yeah, a way, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, or, or, or simplistic, but I mean, you must have a belief that we are doing that, or, or in your case, you must have a belief that you are serving the doc filmmaking community, don't you? Um, well, I, you know, I am. Tom, I can assure you that you are. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> I promise you that you are. <laughs> well, I appreciate that. I mean, look, I'm following my own passions. You yeah. know, I'm I'm trying to put out content in the world that I want to hear. Mm. Um, and I think about the, you know, the Comedy Central shows like Jon Stewart's Daily Show or yeah. Stephen Colbert's uh, um, show that I used to um, enjoy so much. But the, the most frustrating parts of me, parts of those shows for me were their guest interviews because they'd always get terrific guests. Yeah. The format of the show meant that it was going to be, you know, a shorter than 10 minute interview uh, and there was going to have to be jokes involved. And 
it often felt like you know missed opportunities um, yeah. to you know to get anywhere interesting uh, with those guests. That's right. Although of course it was a tremendous opportunity for those guests to you know have the eyeballs of that audience to <laughs> right. you know, sell their promotions, their yeah, or whatever else they got to promote. Yeah. So you know it's you know in in, in my more modest space of uh, pure nonfiction podcast, I certainly don't have the audience of, of that of those kind of uh, television hosts, but I do have the luxury to have a longer conversation yeah. to you know go into you know places that just kind of get off the boilerplate promotional patter of the average documentary. And that's what I'm trying to do. And, and and I think we both certainly have that in common, this idea of having sort of a, a more, a deeper and more complex, interesting conversation with a doc industry guest. And quite frankly, I'll have that filmmaker thank me for having that conversation. Because as you know, they're not accustomed to having that conversation that often when they're being interviewed by anyone from the media. So I think they appreciate that and they appreciate talking about their craft. And certainly I think they also appreciate being able to talk to it with someone who knows the craft and someone who is, and, and, and as well as they know that that, that, that that conversation is going out to an audience that is much like themselves. And I think they really appreciate that. I think you're right. And, uh, and I appreciate you taking the time with me. Absolutely, absolutely, Tom. This has been a a lovely conversation. As we uh as we do finish up here, do you have one piece of advice that you might share with me? You know, one doc filmmaking podcast to another. <laughs> My own personal taste in uh, in podcasting, yeah, is like to get to the heart of the matter as fast as you can. Yeah. Uh, you know, I think there's a certain podcasting style that you, you know, you see with a Mark Marin on his WTF podcast or another podcast I listen to a lot is uh, long form that's interviews yeah. with with nonfiction journalists. It's great. I love uh, it. And writers. And um, and both those podcasts have like a certain amount of like warm up time where the hosts are just are kind of chatting about things before they get to their guests. Yeah, and, yeah. And I always spend my time just, you know, kind of hitting the fast, fast forward, forward button. button, right? 30 seconds uh, forward, 30 seconds to, forward. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. To, to get to the guest interview. So, you know, my own my own personal feeling about anyone who's doing especially an interview driven podcast yeah. is like get to the interview as fast as possible. That's what we're here for. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, Tom Powers, thank you so much for coming on to the program. I really appreciate you. I said, like, as I said, I've wanted to have you on the documentary life for, for a bit of time now. So it's great to have you on. Thank you so much for talking about TIFF, Doc NYC, your own documentary filmmaking experience, as well as, of course, the podcast, Pure Nonfiction. Again, for anyone listening, we will have links to all of these and so much more up in the show notes. Tom, thank you so much. And yeah, I look forward to uh, potentially meeting you somewhere down the road, probably at Doc NYC, eh? That would be my pleasure. Thanks again for listening to the show, and remember to like and subscribe to this channel. Also, remember for any of the URLs that may or may not be outdated, and you want to get the most up-to-date information, perhaps for the documentary filmmaking courses, for the blog, for other episodes, just go ahead and check in the show notes below on this YouTube page, and that'll give you the correct URLs to use. Thanks again. Have a great day.